to everyone watching this footage. It's Leviathan here again, and to start things off, I'm going to introduce myself to newcomers. I'm born high-functioning and autistic, I'm obsessed with fiction, and I'm planning to make my own creative universe like the late Stan Lee did. This video is going to be different. I have made a pitching story, which is three pages long so far, because I'm planning to pitch it to a company at some point in my future regardless of which company, it just depends. From what I was told, three pages is enough for one comic book. And I hope you guys enjoy what I've inputted as of so far, because I don't want to procrastinate on anything. Here's the story. Well, it's not much of a story as it is like watching on a surveillance camera and describing what you see and hear. That's basically how to put this, to be honest. Here it is. A calm, soothing morning in the New York City of the default Earth. Birds are chirping, the streets were bustling, and a temperate breeze flows through the city like an elegant river of pure oxygen. In the mighty and jagged abode that is Blader Tech Tower, we see Madame Shear resting on a science-approved cushioned chair. Dr. Blader's brown eyes were flickering from fatigue, and her long black hair was drooping from the peak of the chair. Her bladed hands with fingers the size of jag daggers were sheathed into a more suitable pair of decoyed hands. She was resting calmly as her computer system, Maya, was multitasking between updating the native tech and scanning New York for any inevitable circumstances that would manifest at any point. As she was relaxing, Dr. Blader realized something and decided to ask Maya, Is there anything yet from Tyranitar? And Maya responds, As of so far, nothing yet from Dr. Parks or her sinful six teammates. Is there something bothering you right now, sir? I'm happy to hear your thoughts. Well, it's just been a few weeks since Dr. Parks' last attempt at dealing with myself. Still wish that we were friends again with, like we used to be, but I feel that something worse than before might waltz out of nowhere and compromise everything. Is that a foolish thing to think? Well, I haven't noticed anything yet, but there's a good chance that Dr. Parks was trying to avoid detection in another of her schemes. Is that why you're worried, sir? Perhaps, said Doc Dr. Blader said, um... I said with a sigh of concern. Suddenly, a loud boom echoes across the city as the windows started breaking haphazardly. Sir, I've just picked up an intrusion. Seems like something big crash landed in the park downtown. It seems to have some kind of Martian ingenuity. Martian, Dr. Blader stated as she rose from her chair in desperation. Maya, contact the paranormal defense. I think Denshin needs to check on this with us. Sure thing, sir, and Maya started sending an SOS to the Paranormal Defense Headquarters, miles up northwest of New York. Up at the headquarters, we see researchers and other affiliates in the middle of testing oddities, machinery, and the like. We head to Denstrini's quarters, where she was eating a block of chocolate in her hands. Debbie was a tall and robust individual with the bloodline of a native to Tartarus and her stone-red right hand with pointed knuckles marked with prehistoric demonic runes. Her tail relaxed on the couch she was sitting on, her deep black hair elegantly brushed mere hours earlier. As Debbie heard a beeping from a nearby panel, she turned her red eyes at the source and checked for the message. Reading that it was urgent from Maya and Sheer, Debbie was disgusted with the chance of Martian activity in the park of New York. Debbie lost her adopted mother from the hands of the tyrannical Mars, a ruler of the Red Planet bound to terraform the globe, and she hadn't forgiven her since. Standing from her couch, she went to Gilface's tank where, she was, when he, where he was fast asleep with a CPAP device strapped to his face. She disabled the device, and Gilface awoke in a frenzied panic. Debbie, he said in discomfort, you know I can't sleep without the machine worker working. My sleep apnea is severe. I'm sorry, Gil. 
but I've got a message from Sheer about Martian Tech landing in downtown New York. The both of us need to help them investigate it just in case it goes south. What about Ignisha? Gilface said in irritation. Ebony's got her own things right now. It's best to leave her be until later. And the two heroes headed out to New York for the investigation. Down in the park of New York, Denstrini and Gilface met up with Madame Shear as the three of them encountered the impact zone that crushed a few trees. It was a large dome-shaped orb coated with rusted iron, a glowing line streaking its equator with the glowing point going right. It just crash-landed from the sky. What does Mars want with this device? Shear asked. The Martians were struggling with overpopulation for who knows how long, but their best hope of recovering is to take over this Earth to make it more suitable for them to thrive. Something we just can't allow, Denstrini stated. As Denstrini stepped forward to the machine, she had flashbacks of her adopted mother's funeral and dented the device with her demonic fist. Debbie, Gilface said in worry, you shouldn't do that. It might be a biobomb or something. It's fine, Gil. Then Strini stated as she found that her arm was stuck inside. Um, that'll help? I'm stuck on something. As she and Gilface helped her get unstuck, she stated in disappointment, I think something's in there. As she was finally released, the three heard a low gurgling from within the punched hole on the side of the machine. In seconds, transparent sludge with the viscosity of water emerged from it. As they stood and watched, the creature stood up from its amorphous state and made a high-pitched ringing for the city to hear, and it turned toward the three heroes as they were upset at the predicament. Uh, blast it, it's the barren one, Denshirny stated as they started dealing with the Martian menace. Hours earlier, we start observing Mars and her people on the seemingly desolate planet Mars. Across the sun-struck deserts, we soar into the Valles Marineras, the massive canyon the size of the U.S., until we see a subterranean civilization of otherworldly bug creatures. They are trying their best to dig across the underground while also avoiding any aquifers that could decimate the people like a mighty flood of sulfuric acid. The people are also struggling in the curse of overpopulation as we head to the capital domain of the determined Mars, or simply Marisa. Mars is a humanoid Martianoid created to control the suffering people of Mars. She has red glowing eyes, deep red hair, and a jaggedy left bohawk. It's mostly made of Martian metals and has a nuclear blaster in the place of a three-fingered arm. After figuring out what to do next to the default Earth, Mars finally states, People, I've got a plan. To destroy the natives of Earth and lift us of our curse. We shall send the barren one to the Earth and let it loose across the gluttonous populace. But sir, Martian servant stated, the only reason we trapped the barren one in Diamos was because not even us could properly destroy it. Don't be alarmed, fellow Glich. The barren one can be mostly destroyed by solar radiation. In their foolish attempts at stopping the creature, they would evidently doom their own planet in the process. Afterwards, we'll trap it back in Deimos where it belongs. Mars then stated on the loudspeaker, Initiate the Baron One's transport in twenty minutes. For the blood of the Conqueror, we shall rise from the ashes and tremble no more. Back in the present, Madame Shear, Denstrini, and Gilface were trying their best to confront the Baron One. Keep your distance, Denstrini yelled. If it makes physical contact with organic matter, it could turn your insides into horrid paste. As Madame Shear ran to the Baron One in hopes of slashing it, she found there was like attacking a stream of water, and the Baron One started breaking apart her left augmentation piece by piece. Get off me, you pile of puke! Shear yelled in disgust. Before it could we reach Shear's organic elbow, Denstrini lifted her demonic fist on fire and tossed it half a block away, saving Shear's life. Thanks, Debbie, Shear stated. The Baron One's intolerant to extreme heat. Ah, uh, come on now, Denstrini yelled as the Baron One charged at Gilface, who tried to arm his plasma ray gun. Mere centimeters from contact, 
Gilfay shot an oozy of plasma bullets, stunning the amorphous being. Roaring in pain and desperation, the Baron one booked it and started dissolving random passersby who were watching the fight from a distance. Denstrini then grabbed the creature by the non-existent throat and slammed it back into the pod where it was kept. I hate to do this, but I must, Denstrini said in denial. Denstrini attempted to make a powerful strike that, could, that would level New York City and thus vaporizing the barren one. But as she was about to jump, a massive hand with red nails snatched the barren one, making it scream in pain from nuclear exposure. The three heroes found it to be Colossa, who arrived at the last moment. Colossa has sky blue eyes, long platinum white hair and shoulder length, is wearing a black set of athletic casual wear, and is currently standing 175 feet tall. As the Baron One was struggling to get free from her grasp, Colossus' hand glowed ever so brightly and thus made it more radioactive. Oh no you don't, Snotball, Colossa yelled as she made a nuclear blast from her hand towards the open blue sky, vaporizing the Baron One in seconds. After the victorious arrival, Madame Shear, Denstrini, and Gilface ran to the uh, relaxed Colossa to thank her. I was about to level the city in order to stop it. It's a relief that you showed up, Shannon, Denstrini replied. Don't mention it, Debbie. My nuclear powers are hotter than the surface of the sun, just like normal nuclear radiation. I heard on the news as this was going down and just couldn't miss the opportunity. Well, we might need your help again with the barren one. You see, only a few bits of atoms are left of that monster, and now it's heading back to Diemos to recover. And Gilface then added, Thanks a plenty for the help again, Miss Colossa. Is it alright if we drop by Murray Tower for a visit? Gil, that's when he stated. We don't have time to hang out with Colossa. Besides, she's got a full plate, too. Actually, Debbie, I don't have many plans for right now. Let's have some lunch at Murray Tower. Everything will be on the house. Before Denshini could speak, Madame Shear says, That's great. We'd love to hang out. There's better things to do than watch TV and binge eat chocolate like some people. Take that back, Deborah. Keep calm. We need some time outside of work, Gilface stated to Denstrini. Colossa is giving us permission after all, and free food too. After a sigh of disapproval, Denstrini stated, All right, Gil. After a few hours, we can head back. We shouldn't be lazy about our duties at the PD. Not a problem, Debbie. After me. Colossus smiled as she took the three to her home in Murray Tower. Well, that's the story so far. I hope that it's proper to you guys, and I hope I didn't screw anything up with the uh, hesitation and such. I, I'm just trying my best to make things work. And also, I made this illustration just yesterday, as far as I know. It's supposed to be the embodiment of Sin, the Seven Deadly Sins, a character known as Sin Seven, who created Satana, who created Tartarus, and also the grandmother of Denstrini. So it wasn't if it wasn't for Sin Seven, Denstrini and Tartarus would never be. Greed, gluttony, um Envy. Sloth, wrath, pride, and lust. And just so you know, they're all embodiments of the same entity. And I think it might make sense to have it separate into all seven different manifestations. I'll explain more about Sin 7 at some point in the future. I just hope that this year's Christmas would be worth it in terms of satisfaction because I just wanted to feel pleasant like how it used to. You know how it is. I just want to feel pure again, you know? I'm sorry for everything, just so you guys know. And if you guys want, you could like, subscribe, comment down below, and share if you want. It's your choice. It's all on you. Hope you guys have a fine um, rest of the month and a fine Christmas when the time is nigh. And until next time, in transmission.